Hello, welcome to my presentation on CoinFlip, a randomness testing suite made in Python. So with random number generators, you will likely want to test that they produce fairly random sequences. So here's an example of a random number generator, which is essentially just using Python's own random module. So we can actually generate a sample output and we will use this to actually test uh, this sample output on randomness tests. So CoinFlip provides randomness tests uh, in the ran test package here. So we can execute this test on that sample output that we defined, defined here. And if I show you that now, there will be a result that prints. And this result gives you ver various bits of information that relates to, to this test and what it tells you about your uh, sample output. In addition to being a Python library, we also provide a command line interface. And you can access the command line interface via the CoinFlip uh, command. So, in this demonstration, I will be talking about the randomness tests in the Python package, the command line interface, and the various testing strategies that we use to ensure that the randomness tests are valid. So this demonstration is related to the report that I've written, and more information will be available in the description of this video. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's start looking at the, the randomness testing package in CoinFlip. So I'll start a Python interactive shell. So you can see here that we interact with the, the tests using the CoinFlip.randTests, randtest for randomness testing uh, namespace here. So let's pull the monobits test. And we can just run that test on any old binary sequence. So 01001. So it's run, we're getting all the warning for now. And we print the result. Essentially, it just gives a, a pretty printed, you know, uh, summary of what's happening in that result. So the, the summary here is that you know value zero has a count of three, zero, 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 value one has a count of two, one, one. So essentially the, the results of these tests are trying to trying to give you an idea of what's actually been happening in the tests. Because obviously the p-value is the final thing that that you know statistical testing, hypothesis testing is interested in, but but actually there's a lot more insight to be had once you look at the, the other test variables that like may that p-value uh, value. So we can try running this test again, but let's try it on a different sequence. So Bob and Alice is not zero and one, but it is a binary sequence, so it will still work. So we can just print that. And you can see here, the result here is essentially the same as the result there. The only difference, Bob is zero and Alice is one. So the, the, the randomness tests actually work on any type of, bi of binary sequence. So it doesn't matter about the, the value inside of those sequences. So we can try running it on a non-binary sequence. So we have Bob, Alice, and Matthew. So that's a sequence of length three, and it will not work because there's three distinct values in that sequence. So the randomness tests are not built for, for non-binary sequences. So we can try importing a different test, and we can run it. So let's just run that on the same sequence, 01001. Um, and just to, just to show you, we have a warning here. So the test trying to warn users when they have inputs that go against recommendations. So the sequence length is five. Zero on, so that's sequence length of five. That's very small for, for hypothesis testing. And this actually recommends a sequence, uh, sequence length of a thousand. And, and that's a very common pattern in these tests where you want really much larger sequences to have more meaningful results. So we can print our result. And it's different from the previous result, how that was, how that looked, because it's a different test. And these values make more sense if you're familiar with the tests. Um, it tries and helps new users, you know, people who are completely not familiar with with random testing. It tries and like gives them perspective, but like you're going to reap the most benefit if you have more familiarity with the random testing. So we can import a different test, binary matrix rank. And let's just run that. So that's that. Uh, we have another warning here. I won't get too much into it, but essentially, uh, NIST has more complex recommendations, not just minimum size. And so, so warnings like this just tell you that a certain parameter. Obviously, the user didn't pick a parameter there, but it was defaulted for them. Um, but yeah, that default parameter was against the warnings, and so that gives uses more of a context of what's been what's happening in these tests. Um, so like we don't want to stop them using the test, but we want to tell them 
uh, you, you may want to reconsider, you know, trust in results of this test that much. So we print that result and it's different, uh, different to the other two because they're different tests. Um, once you're more familiar, you'd understand what, you know, this is trying to say. So we can try running the test on a different sequence, this time of lm 3 So that is a binary sequence, but it gives an error because the binary matrix rank test and other tests have minimum requirements. So for example, the binary matrix rank works with matrices and the, the smallest matrix you can have is two by two, which is, you know, a length of four. So a length of three just cannot be run. So we can't give a warning here. We need to tell the user that you cannot do this because the test is just not built for uh, for the sequence. See all of the all of the randoms tests. You can look at the documentation. The docs are very basic right now, but if you're interested in the randoms tests, you can click at the reference here, and essentially I just list every single test that CoinFlip currently implements. Um, it gives you a brief description. It's not fully descriptive, uh, but it'll give you the general gist of what happened. And there's always keyword arguments which you know will change the nature of the tests and actually all the tests and so I mentioned NIST I didn't explain NIST uh, the National Institute of something something uh, they're very clever people they they made uh, this paper which recommends various random tests and this is what CoinFlip tries to tries to aim so you can look at my implementation and it will it will follow not exactly and um, my report goes into more detail not exactly but it tries to follow the the general gist of these tests so now let's look at the command line interface for coinflip so we can just do coinflip help here and that will just show you a brief you know help message for the the command line interface and um, what i'm interested in showing you now is the store system so stores in coinflip essentially are folders that consist of RNG output and the results of testing the RNG output and it provides an abstraction to the user so they don't have some messy file system when they run multiple tests on multiple RNG output. So if we just do coinflip ls that just says coinflip what stores do you recognize right now and coinflip currently recognizes no stores. So we're going to upload some data to coinflip so I prepared output.txt and as you can see it's just a sequence of zeros and ones so it's a binary sequence every value is delimited by a new line and that's the format that coinflip currently accepts so we can just load that in using the load command and we can give it a name so i'll call it example and it's loaded successfully and this sequence represents you know the the actual contents of output.txt and we can actually look in our folders, in our in our directories, so the series, the the, the series that represents um, this, you know, the machine readable series, is actually stored in our app data folder. So for Linux, that would be dot local share coin flip. An example is the current you know store that we're working with here. So I click on example and series pickle that represents the the series here. So we can run all the tests on this. Um, first of all, I'll just show you. Uh, there it is, example. CoinFlip recognizes that store now. And we can run all the tests on example. As you can see, all the tests that are available on CoinFlip are run on that data. You can actually look at the folder here, and now there's results.db, which is the saved results. And if you remember before, there's this pretty printed message that the results give out. So the monobits test, it's the test statistic and p-value, and this is for all of the all of the randomness tests. It always gives you a statistic and p-value, and then it gives you a summary of something interesting to that test itself. And when you're more familiar with the randomness tests, this becomes more useful and interesting. Uh, warning messages are pretty in the command line interface. Uh, using the Python interpreter, it's very messy and confusing. So it's still obvious to the user, but it's not, you know, in your face. And the same with error messages. It's just, uh, it's descriptive, but there's no annoying trace back or anything like that. Uh, in this specific example, uh, the sequence length of 114 is too small for longest runs test. So when there's an error in the test, it just skips the test. Um, and there's warnings here that relate to both the length and some property 
Uh, typically, these warnings, the ones that are after sequence length warnings, are typically, you know, related to the sequence length. So it just runs all the tests, it gives you all the test specific results, and this would be interesting when you're interested in a particular problem. Like, for example, we have a fail here, so you can look at overlap and template matching, and you can see what the problem was. Um, this is probably the opportunity for you to use it to learn and what this test means and why it failed. But typically, with such a small data set of 114, you know, a test is going to fail. It's not particularly good for random testing. So we can try and upload another piece of data. So RNG output2.txt is just a larger version of the one before, just zeros and ones delimited by new lines. So we can load it in. I'll call it example 2. See, it's quite big now. So we can conflip ls, and now example 2 is next to example. We look at our app data folder, and there's example 2. And that's series.pickle, and that's what this is. So we can run a test. We can run specific tests in CoinFib as well, which is quite useful. So I've run the binary matrix rank. And you see here the results.db currently only stores uh, the results of this test. That's the only one that's been run. You can remove stores as well, so when you're done with them, you'll know, organize your folders. I'll do config ls. There's now no example 2 there, no example 2 here in the app data folder. We can remove all of our stores, that will remove example. And yeah, that's the basics of the, the command interface. Uh, we can look at the documentation and it will just give you a list of all the commands that are currently available in, in CoinFlip. And so with that you should be able to use it. So on to the testing. The tests are located in the test folder in CoinFlip. Uh, let's start with the random testing tests. It's confusing, the terminology I know. Uh, we can run a specific example on our test suite. So for example here, I'm running a example which is in the NIST paper. So in the NIST paper, it describes its tests. So like this is the description for the binary matrix rank test. Um, it gives you some information. But what we're interested in is the walkthrough that it gives, because Every test has a walkthrough given with an example. So there's an example here of a binary sequence. This is the sequence. There's some keyword arguments here. And it essentially runs through what the test should do for that sequence. And it gives us a final statistic and it gives us a final p-value. And that can be all programmatically defined uh, in, in, in this, a example tuple. So essentially this tuple is just a named tuple and it essentially just defines the, the, the example that was given by NIST. Uh, so using just, just this information, we can run our tests, so our version of the binary matrix rank test, and we can give it these bits and these keyword arguments, and we can test whether it gets a statistic and a p-value, which is basically the same as, as this. Um, we do this for pretty much every random test we have. Uh, I'll give you another example of the discrete Fourier uh, transform test, um, and this is where it fails. Um, so I'll just show you quickly. This is the definition of that test I just ran. Um, there's no keyword arguments, it's fairly simple, but it fails. Uh, so one of the interesting things is if we have a failure here, uh, we can test the same example, we can use the same example on a different test suite. So currently, uh, we implement uh, adapters for two test suites, one by student Gordon Reed and one by David Johnston. So we can run the same test case on their suites, and you can see they both fail. So in this example, it's actually quite interesting because our p-value here is the same as you know student Gordon Reed's and David Johnston's. So we all got the same value, but we all got it wrong. So I talk about this more in the report, but essentially the ability to compare our results to you know the results of other suites is actually very useful in having a greater understanding of whether NIST is correct, whether we're correct, or whether there's some other conclusion. Uh, so beyond that we actually have something called property-based testing and this features quite heavily in our in our testing strategy. So we use a library called Hypothesis. Um, Hypothesis is property-based testing. Um, what that means is that we define the parameters of input. So I'll give you an example right up here. We tell Hypothesis, can you generate a binary sequence? That, that's all we say. 
and it generates a sequence of 0 and 1 and then it applies this sequence into the Molibits test in coin flips on random testing suite and also the testing suites of Julian Gordon Reed and David Johnston. And essentially what, what we do, we, we execute with the same sequence and we see whether we get the same p-value at the end. So if we get the same p-value, then that gives us greater confidence that our you know tests are valid. And Pyphopsis uh, essentially generates bits in many different random unpredictable ways. So we have 0, 1 here, 1, 0 here, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, etc, etc. And you have all of these different kinds of of input sequences that are that are being applied to our test and the other suites that we adapt, and essentially we're just trying to trying to figure out whether we're different from from other suites. Um, doesn't necessarily mean we're wrong, but it means that we should explore it more if we we if we do have differences with other suites. So the monobits test is very simple because you can only pass a sequence. There's no other parameters to pass. But we have the frequency within block test, for example, and all the other tests that have a, Additional keyword arguments, and so hypotheses can actually, you know, generate composite um, inputs. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a second. So this example here is another binary sequence that's been generated, and there's an additional value here, which is the block size. The block size is a, a keyword argument for the the frequency within block test. Um, so actually, the funny thing is, this example is a bit ridiculous because essentially. It's generated a, a huge input sequence, but the block size is massive. Two two nine three is 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 completely um, ridiculous. But the whole point of using hypothesis here is that we want to, you know, automatically reach these strange test cases. But we can try using hypothesis on our command line interface ourselves. So what I showed you before was just testing our actual tests, our actual randomness tests. But we can actually test the command line interface and. I do this by using a state machine. This is an example where I test the command line interface. So if you recall, we have this stores concept, and I want to test that the stores concept is robust, like the, the abstractions stay. So essentially what Hypothesis does here is that it generates these stores, you know, if you recall, stores are essentially folders in our local, you know, operating systems app data folder. So it generates these stores, it removes these stores, it does some tests with these stores, and essentially, Hypothesis is trying. It's trying to break our command line interface. Um, I'll give you an example. So, here's the start of a new of a new you know test case that um, Hypothesis is making. So, it initiates um, this this state machine, and it adds a store. It adds a store with this sequence. So, an example here was it adds a store. Then it tries to find that store, this store, V1, it tries to find that listed, if you recall, on the, the coin flip ls command. Um, so essentially we're just testing the, the the state, the abstractions of coin flip are robust. That's what we're testing, essentially. So we add a store, we add another store, we remove a store, and essentially all of these methods, you know, there's only three methods in the state machine, but they happen in random sequences. They happen in... I mean, if we go right to the top, we've got very basic examples. We add a store, we add a store, and then we finish. And then later on, you know, we have more complex examples. Like we just add loads of stores. We just add stores and remove stores. And um, all, of, all of those commands, we want to use them quite regularly when we make changes. If we want to test that our, you know, our changes don't break anything. So we use something called tox. And tox is a command line wrapper. So you can see here that we've told it to... Basically, use all the tests that we want. So this was the cli roots test. That's the command line interface testing that was above here. Uh, we've got another test, uh, the comparison test, and then the test ran test and examples. That's just all the examples from the NIST paper. Now, Tox especially allows us to use this in uh, continuous integration quite easily. So, for example, we use Travis. Uh, Travis is a CI service that uh, is linked to our GitHub repository. So every time we push a change, it just runs Tox. Um, you can see down below, this was the same output that we had in the in the command line. We, we use courage as well. It's not really been looked at too much, but essentially it tells us what code our, our tests are actually covering, which is quite useful. So another thing we do is 
use continuous integration in Windows environment. So, so Travis, I believe, runs on on Linux, but we want to run it on the Windows environment because we want, you know, Windows use, users to to be able to use CoinFlip. So, I don't have a Windows machine, so it's very useful actually to use uh, AppVia here to run our tests on the Windows machine. Now, but in the report, I do I do mention like one very you know very helpful. Um, uh, bug that that was found using using that fair. Uh, um, so so yeah, uh, the testing strategy in in Confluent is probably the most important part because I have no statistics background, I have no you know cryptography background, but I can still kind of say to users that Coinflip is a robust piece of software because we test our tests against NIST's own examples and suites which are based on NIST suite. We don't test. NIST suite itself yet. So NIST stone suite, STS, um, is a C library um, and obviously I'm using Python but you can make bindings for C to Python. Um, C Python is based in C so it's a fairly simple process so in the future we definitely want to you know be able to interact with NIST's own test suite in CoinFlip testing. That'd be very useful but currently we, we use two open source Python projects um, Random, that's by Shunan Gordon Reed, and SP800 something something, which is a generic name by David Johnson. Both of these were academic implementations, really. They were for learning purposes more so than practical purposes. Even these two implementations gives us further insight into like how our random test compares. But yeah, it just gives us more confidence on on the the actual practical validity of CoinFlip.